the closer I get, you're wasting your time. The more you ignore me, the closer I get, you're wasting your time. Is that you? Yeah, there he is. 981 in my mum's front room. I love it. They used they used a shot similar. It was for a magazine called The Face. Yeah, yeah, I remember the face. Isn't the face coming back or back? Is it? Yeah. Oh. Yeah, it's um I think owned by the same company that do Mix Mag and they also bought out Kerrang. I think that's their now three flagship magazines. Because I guess face was like the vice, wasn't it? Yeah, it was fashion and music. Uh, this is fashion with the the trousers from Johnson's and they do a they do the picture of the band and then they say where all our clothes came from. Right. Like a, so what we're looking at here, obviously, because you won't be able to see this, is Polaroid photos from 1981 of a young rockabilly Boz Bora. Well, I've been Look at the size of those trousers. That's amazing, isn't it? <laughs> 28 waist. <laughs> I, they didn't do bigger than a 32. Um, yeah, I've been going through some boxes and stuff that's up in the loft, trying to make a bit of room. And um, I'm not quite sure what to do with these, really. I'll just probably file them back away. Have you done a book? No, was it? Is that something you consider doing? Was it something yeah. you'd like to do? Yeah, I've, I've talked about uh, my the guy Michael that runs the label that I put my stuff out on called Fabrique in uh, Austria. He's always on about just having someone follow me around for a weekend, right? And start writing things now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and you just sort of dictate silly little stories because I don't, I don't remember them all. You know? No. Well, I'm always amazed by that. Whenever I read anyone's autobiography, the level of detail that they go into from, you know, the early, early childhood years onwards, you know, is kind of astounding. I don't think I'd be able to recall all of my Well, I've been reading the Edith James stories. book. I'm nearly at the end of it. I remember you saying the other day, yeah. And she's, uh, I don't know how long that guy was with her, but it's, the cover's it's thorough. Very, yeah, it's yeah. very thorough. Yeah. And you were saying she was, I guess, someone who struggled a lot with oh, a lot substance people, abuse yeah. and... There you go. A lot of demons, yeah. Yeah. I guess a lot of those early jazz and blues singers were troubled artists, weren't they? Well, we were listening to uh, Chet Baker last night. Yeah. As I was drifting off, and he was, I mean, he had a few demons. It, well, that was kind of the, the drug of choice, wasn't it, within jazz, was was heroin. Yeah. I don't Dark. Know why, why it was so, uh, it was like a something you had to do, you had to go for. Yeah, it, yeah, you know? yeah. So you were born 62, right, Boz? Yep. Uh, so... Let's talk about your early years, if you can remember them, <laughs> on the subject of that. Uh, were your parents into music? Was it a musical household you grew up in? Um, a little bit. My dad sang in a choir, and my mum played piano by ear, but her sister had the piano lessons, and she didn't. It should have been the other way around. And then at a very early age, I showed interest in music. And my mum took a job at the school as a dinner lady to pay for my musical education. I started off on the recorder. And then I wanted to play the clarinet, but my hands weren't big enough. So I had to wait till they got bigger so I could learn the clarinet and then the saxophone. And the guitar came along and I learned classical guitar and studied music. Wow, so you were a multi-instrumentalist from a very early age. Yeah, yeah, it's all maths, really. What was the, I guess, the inspiration behind wanting to learn the clarinet? Was that the likes of Chet Baker or...? No, it was... Um, I was watching the TV... And my mum said, do you want to play a new instrument? And I said, yeah, I want to play that. And it was Kenny Ball and his Jasmine. Okay. And she said the trumpet, which is what Kenny Ball played. And I said, no, what that bloke's playing in the background? And I don't remember being drawn to it, but obviously I was. And that was a clarinet. We've spoke about this a few times. T-Rex, would it be safe to say, were the, the band that really drove you into starting a rock and roll path? Or was yeah. there a few? No, I, I, lo I love pop music. And... Um, I think it was Mark Bonin that made was the first person that made me want to do something like that. The power that the electric guitar had and uh, everything that came with it, pop music. I thought, that, as I say, I was a fan from about the age of eight or maybe eight years old. And then I first heard Hot Love and Get It On would have been 71. And then I started playing guitar when I was about 12. 74 so it's just a gradual growth really and was was glam like was the aesthetic and the imagery of glam something that yeah. ignited a fire in you as well oh yeah i loved all, all those sweet and slade 
Bowie T Rex. Um, yeah, I loved the that's the start of it, and then it went a bit rockabilly. Right, that's oh, so a rockabilly came before punk, did it for you? And then punk came along. Right, and a very quick succession. Yes, like well, we, bang bang yeah, bang. I was yeah, I had a quiff, and I'd be going to punk gigs at the Roundhouse. So I'd have to beat myself up on a regular basis. <laughs> <laughs> and who were the out of the punk bands? And and did you start the Polecats? Was it seventy seven? We started, started rehearsing in yeah. We our first gig was at a party in very early um, seventy eight, probably February around early February. Um, we played punk and we played rock and roll. And did you fit seamlessly on both bills? Because I guess it was that time when. Nah, not really. No. No, we. Which crowds were more receptive to you? Were you well, too punk we, for rockabilly and too rockabilly for punk? Or yeah. So was there just, a bit of that? We just went with rockabilly in the end. You did? Yeah. Is that because the punks just were kind of, I guess, when f- punk first started, it was either you're pure punk or you're not punk. Was that the criticism that you guys we, came across? Because we only played little gigs back then. We didn't really play any major gigs until maybe 1980. So in 78 and 79, we were just playing in people's little pubs and... No, there wasn't really a scene that we fitted onto. Were you one of the first bands then in the UK to be sort of taking on that genre in a new, yeah, energetic, the rockabilly as it was came out. Kinda. The young kids they didn't really play teddy ball rock and roll anymore. That's what we started off playing. Yeah, but we we started to play more authentic, what we thought was authentic zen and rockabilly, and it had that punk en- edge to it and was electrified, and so it became. What they now call neo rockabilly, right? Not really psychobilly, which is more punk. So, who did you play with in those early years that would stand out as um, the key bands of that time? I just saw a, a, a flyer for a gig that we did supporting Matchbox at the Music Machine. I think that was February nineteen eighty. So that was our first sort of big, big show. Um. We played Teddy Boy pubs and clubs, which was quite an odd thing because we were we weren't really Teddy Boy. Um, there was a, a an agent called Paul Barrett who sadly just died yesterday. I've been reading his tributes today, right. but he managed Crazy Cavern. He managed Shaken Stevens, and he had a huge rock and roll agency that every rock and roll musician. Was was on you know, when I managed Alan Wilf. He was getting Wilf gigs. So uh, yeah, now, 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 now. that's my wife's phone. <laughs> She's not it's, hid- it. <laughs> it's hidden somewhere in there. <laughs> I woke up this morning. Now, 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 now. You're so, looking for trouble. So where our gigs, our gigs got bigger and bigger. Um, and then I think we we managed when the Stray Cats came over. This helped us to break down the door, really. They uh, got a lot of press, and we were doing the same sort of thing, and uh, it enabled us to get to a wider audience, and eventually with a recording contract. And did you go over stateside as well? Did the Polecats manage to we played, make inroads over we there? Played two, we played three gigs in New York, and we really should have played more gigs in different on. places. We should have gone to LA when we had Make a Circuit was a hit on K-Rock. Maybe that was in 82. Were you aware that it was? Not or, really. No. A little bit. It was a Richard Blake came home and did a TV show and we were, we went down and met up with him and did some filming. And he said he'd been playing it all the time. But now well, I go to the States a lot and a lot of people remember it from, from the 80s as being part of the K-Rock thing. Yeah, yeah. Well, it was recently, well, not that recently, but fairly recently used in that Wally film trailer, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was... Uh, that's that shows you how you know how ingrained it yeah, was. Yeah. yeah, it's weird. Great. I guess that would have been the case with a lot of bands around that time, right? Pre-internet, when it was harder to keep tracks on sales and markets and territories, is a lot of bands probably didn't realise. Oh, we should have definitely yeah, gone there. We should have gone to Japan. We missed the boat. We didn't go to Japan. I just found a someone was at the Utrecht Record Fair last year and bought me a South African John May dancing polecats. Never knew it existed. 40 years after the fact. <laughs> Brilliant. And that's someone who spends a lot of time travelling record shops yeah, around the world I mean, and you know, digging just, deep. Yeah, I've just got, I just spend my whole time in record stores and I never knew it existed. So I'm that's still mad, finding things out. 
Um, so you use the app called, um, Is it what's the vinyl app you use? Because we need to give that a plug to help oh, people. Oh, yeah. It's called. So for anyone who doesn't know, Boz owns a record shop in Camden called Vinyl Boutique. And I presume your main hobby outside of making music is probably tracing down records. Yeah, I never stop. Worldwide, right? I never stop. But this is just some of the things that are lying around. But i am always got my nose in the internet finding them. Um, so this is the Vinyl District. And that's a free app you get. Yep. All smartphones. And if you press stores in Toxico Records, which is two miles away. And then Vinyl Boutique. There you go. Four miles away. Click on it. So you get into any kind of city or country, load that up. You can be going on the, med- on the motorway. I did it on the motorway. It's somewhere in Poland somewhere. Yeah, yeah. And it said the nearest record shop was in Warsaw, 140 miles away. Sometimes in weird places. It will, it will just as a crow flies and show you someone that's a thousand miles away because it's the nearest when I was in Costa Rica. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's fun and it's got reviews. And, I, and when I was in Sweden trying to find a, a prog rock store, it was on a side street and I couldn't find it. And when I put this on, it showed me another two shops that I didn't know about. Right. So it's very so it's definitely worth it. And it's funny because I think that people are probably of the common perhaps misconception that vinyl stores are dying out but that's not necessarily the case is it oh i think i think chain stores are certainly yeah struggling but are the individual stores definitely definitely growing they're hanging on in there as well some of these old when i go into lisbon now i went in the other day but i didn't do any record shopping but when i looked at the app there was a lot more stores um than there was five years ago because people seem to be going really crazy for vinyl don't they at the moment and have been for a few years now well, yeah, it's it's for the youngsters. It's a new thing. Yeah, and for the older generation, it's a return to something that they knew and loved when they were younger. I think in this digital world as well, where everything is very digital and uh, throwaway, there's something to be said for something which is a bit nostalgic. It's weighty. It's kind of you know, it's tangible. You can hold it. It's almost like a piece of art. Oh, definitely. And the sound quality, I think, is. For certain records, anyway, that were made to be played on vinyl, the sound quality is vastly superior, isn't it? I th- I think it is. I <clears throat> a long time ago, I had, one of my records came out, and and I got it on CD and vinyl. When I put the two on, I thought the vinyl sounded. I beat them with the same system, and I thought that the vinyl sounded better, even if the CD maybe had more clarity within the tracks. I don't know whether I'm just used to hearing things a little bit more muddy. Yeah. And I've got drawers of that, that top top drawer is just full of CDs. I, I don't like the cases, so I throw them away because they take up too much room. Oh, and you put them in little wallets, do you? Yeah, so there's, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's thousands that, and that box down there is is the same, full of CDs, not in cases. So there's, pardon me, but I've got them all on my iTunes. So I, I don't yeah. really play CDs anymore. Yeah, what well, you know, CDs I think are definitely dying. Like laptops, for instance, now they don't even have a CD drive. I oh, know it's annoying. It is really annoying. I had to go and, from the little Mac up there, I had to you go get the external. Buy, I had to go and buy an plug external, in. and that's that's so old that my my Mac guy said it's not it's not worth putting anything and not worth bothering with. It's not gonna because it, it just won't handle any of the modern yeah uh, applications. Well, I find with that product in particular as well is they're designed, I think, with inbuilt flaws to only last a few years and then for the next year's thing in there. Yeah. Well, they've already got next year's thing, but they're not telling you until next year. Yeah. Yeah. The slow drip feed release. Yeah, they got me. They got me a long time ago. <laughs> uh, so what happened with Polecats? Um, how long did you exist and last as a, a lineup first time around? Well, I started playing in a band with my wife called the Shillelagh Sisters. How did you and Lynn meet? Um, she used to come to Polecat gigs. So she was kind of very much in the scene as well? And- yeah. Yeah, she was... Uh, I mean, we knew a lot of the same people. We worked out that she went. She said she said she was at the Chuck Berry gig. I think it was in seventy six, or maybe seventy seven, at the New Victoria Theatre with the Flying Saucers and the Pirates. And I said, "Oh, which, what show did you go to?" Because I went to the early show. She went. I went to both of them. She was on the way out, and someone said, "I've got a spare ticket. Do you want to?" You know. So we were at the same gig. Amazing. But we didn't know each other. And how was that show? I'd have- absolutely killed to have seen I mean he was young and he was, he, was, he, was, he was on he was on form and the Flying Saucers I loved they were Teddy Boy rock and roll band and they're still playing in, in, in a format 
but um, I was a I was a big fan of them as well. So uh, I had a great night. So you and Lynn start making music together after you yeah. fall for each other. So we had a band called the Shillelagh Sisters. She played. I taught us to play double bass, and a singer was a girl called Jackie O'Sullivan, who we were in contact. We just bought a house over in Portugal, and we're still in contact with her. And she, uh, when she left, she joined Banana Rama. All right. She, yeah, yeah. She was the new girl in Banana Rama. So I started playing with them, and Polecats didn't really do much. So I left the Polecats, and we had a lot of work on with. Shalali Sisters signed to CBS. We had a couple of singles. Did a tour with Spirit Destiny. And um, so I did that. So we that. And then we played, I think, our first gig we played back together, I think, was probably in about 88 in uh, Holland at a festival in Horden. Um, it's a bit hazy. I can't. <laughs> it might have been earlier than that, though. And didn't Tim go over to do some stuff with Slim Jim? Well, from the uh, Tim moved. Tim moved to America. Yeah, in uh, in the eighties, and uh, he moved to LA, and now he's down in Palm Springs. So he's always got little projects on the go. So he did a thing with Slim. He did a band called um, Thirteen Cats with Slim Jim and Smutty Smith from the Rockettes and Danny B Harvey, and uh, he did that for a while. Have you never been tempted by the stateside move? Yeah, yeah, but uh, we didn't do it. No. We we thought about it a couple of times. Is that because you just love London too much? It feels like home, or well, or you just don't like America enough to want to move there? I think that's what it was <laughs> yeah. really, and the ties that we have with family in uh, in England. And you've got the kids now who've obviously grown up and flown the nest. Well, Billy's flown to Australia, <laughs> literally. Uh, yeah, couldn't yeah, be further from the nest. A- well, unless they uh, <laughs> colonise the moon, <laughs> she could get further away. But um, no, Lynn's going to go over here uh, in March. And, um, and then I might you're be... the ones down in Brighton at uni. Yeah, yeah, Pearl's down in, in uni. She was supposed to come back yesterday, but <laughs> she did not <make laughs> no <it>. sign. <laughs> <laughs> so when do you get the call from uh, from Mozza to start playing with him? Is that 91? Yeah, I was, uh, we'd been on a holiday in this mad group of us, we'd Decided there was eight couples and I think there were six kids. And we said, we're all going to go on holiday together. And we're going to go to... You got a picture of the did vacation we, there? I did you? see some pictures in one of these books. We went to um, um, Crete. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Beautiful part of the world. Better. And Carl from Madness came with us, who I only met on the plane going out. So there was four couples and six kids, and we just sort of took over. And um, what you in that big house? Well, it was the, it were the these little apartments. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there he um, is. Hi. How you doing? Hello, Pearl. Just talked about you. Speak of the devil on a podcast. <laughs> yes. <laughs> 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 and um so Carl from Madness Chess Mash and um, we got to uh, be friends and he knew Morrissey and he phoned me one day I was working as a, a recording engineer for Chrysalis Publishing a job I had for about six years and uh, recording all their demos so that was full time was it? yeah yeah. and uh, that was my day job that's what I did the music dried up so I became an engineer were you always fascinated with that side of the business as well from the start? Or was no, it just something you sort I of learned? I didn't like on it the... to begin with. It seemed, when I was a kid, it seemed too laboured. I just wanted to play the songs. You and, went to be in the moment on stage. But as as time's gone on, it's now my favourite. Is it really? Yeah, of, of all the processes, is the recording process. Is that because that appeals? You mentioned the word, it's all maths earlier. Is that because that appeals to that side of your brain? Um, yeah, it's the most inventive. And if I'm not playing, I want people to. I want to draw playing out of people as a producer. Or if I'm recording, it. Uh, I can do anything I like. I can re- reach into different instruments and sounds and construct construct something from the from just from a guitar and a and a click track up to a full orchestrated track. So you like that scientific element of being in the lab cooking up? Yes, it's my favourite now. So then uh, Carl phoned me one day and said. Uh, come out for lunch I said yeah sure, sure. Uh, he said it's with um, Clive Langer the producer 
I said, oh, cool. He said, Dan Morrissey. I said, well, fine. <laughs> and I think that they've been talking about writing songs. And Carl had stuck my name in the pot. So I, we went down and had dinner in Notting Hill, which is near where the studio was. And um, a short time after that, I went to Hook End Manor and we did a, we recorded Pregnant for the last time, the Morrissey single. And Johnny Bridgewood played double bass and Adam White came and played some piano and mouth organ. And Mark Nevin was there and um, the drummer, whose name escapes me at the moment, was playing on tube, plastic tubes, like tom-toms. And then it all went quiet after that had been done. And then... So it was never like an official offer to start with. It was no, just there, a... There was talked about a, a band with, with Mark Nevin without anybody, just with me joining on second guitar, the band that was there. And then that all went away. And then he found the other players who I, I knew them all, Spencer, Gary and Alan. And Mark Nevin left and they offered me the job. We just still have today. <laughs> it's crazy, isn't it? So what's it been now? Almost 30 years, is it? Yes, yeah, 20. What are we in now? 19. Yeah. So it's 28 years. 28 years. I mean, you must have seen firsthand some quite extreme stuff on stage and the fans' reactions oh, yeah. to him at that point in particular, right? Oh, the, the Flaying themselves on stage. and the, 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 All the chairs that were piled up on the stage, Santa Monica. We only played about 15 minutes, complete right. Lovely, beautiful. <laughs> yeah. But the, the, the gigs after that then became a bit heavy politically. If anyone gets on the stage, we're going to shut the gig down and the amount of ambulances were there in case anyone got hurt. It got quite heavy at one point. It's interesting as well because a lot of those fans, I guess, were and probably continue to be male, right? It's, and that's quite a unique thing that he has, I think, that not many other artists have is almost this appeal over... If you want to call it heterosexual like males, a, like a lads band, yeah. Well, that's, but expressing themselves in almost I mean, like the kind the Pogues, of madness, the faces—they all kind of like lads bands. But it it does change. It's really really odd. We, we go to different countries and we'll say, "Did you notice the amount of young girls that were at the front of the gig? It was like predominantly, or predominantly older, or or you know, it's it changes." In, well, let me ask you about this, because one of my favourite areas of the Morrissey fan base, and the most fascinating to me, is the Latino. Oh, yeah. Um, and obviously there's that great band, Mexrosy, yeah. that cover his songs in that style. Um, how does that start? Is that just because of his move over to the States and his exposure over there within perhaps those kind of Latino communities within LA, and then it just spread from there? Yes, I would assume so. I mean, I, I don't really... I can't place it down to one reason or one song or or one occasion but it grew very fast uh, between his heartfelt lyrics and the and the and the mexican culture they just took him to heart and it's it's a lovely thing to behold and you do a lot of shows in south america yeah well, we just, and uh, they're massive are they that was our last show yeah mexico's kind of mainstream Mainstream pop over there we are. Um, trying to think the last place we played. Um, Chile. And that, that, that's that's come up as being quite mental now as well. It's like things go in waves. Chile was mental. I guess that imagery as well, it's very uh, in line with that culture, isn't it? The sort of silhouette of his face and that kind of, you know, snappy dresser kind of yeah, chic I, I think we've, we've... style. Yeah, we've uh, embraced all the Mexican cultures, all with the skulls and yeah, and all that, which I which I really the love. day of the dead sort of stuff. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. Love all that. There's a little one up there. Look. Yeah, there you go. Uh, Adam Ant gave me. So when does that relationship start with Adam? Yeah, um, around I when I was working at Chrysalis, I did all the demos for a band called Max, which was Kevin Mooney, who was the uh, the bass player in the King of Frontier lineup of Adam and the Ants. And Marco did all of the guitar in. So Marco would come in and basically work out what was happening with the bass and the vocal and lay down some great guitar. In. So I got to know him quite well. And he lived just around the corner. 
And then one day out of the blue, he phoned me up and said, "Would I come? Would I go round his house and have and, and have a meeting?" And Adam was there, and Dave Ruffy, who I'd met once. I love Dave Ruffy. What a sweetheart he is! <laughs> I'd met him because he played with Kirsty McCall, who was a friend of ours, and was married to Steve Lillywhite, who was also a friend of mine because I'd he'd produced records with Morrissey. Yeah, he so did. What did he do? He did the Vox everything I, from Vox on I, I Sal Paul Grammer, and uh, Maladjust. Mal- yeah. And um, I had some time off, so um, when I did a small tour of America, and then um, what year is this? Or years? Ninety two or ninety three? Okay, came back, wrote. Some oh, so it's around the same time as when you joined Morrissey, so that's a busy period in your life. Yeah, it's probably a couple <laughs> of years later, probably ninety three, and I did the American tour. Then we wrote a load of songs. Then we made an album called Wonderful, and then I couldn't do the Wonderful tour. So because uh, of Morrissey commitments. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it always comes first. But we stay friends. I saw him at Christmas at the Round House. Oh, I love that track that you did with him on um, vocals. What was it? Jungle Rock. Oh, yeah. That's a fun little number, that is. Yeah, that was... Is uh, the video the official video? You know, that one with all the women in the, the sort of set with the leaves? Oh, no, that's <laughs> taken off of uh, Top of the Pops. Oh, right, okay. That's uh, Pan's People. But yeah, yeah, I think yeah, yeah. Dancing the Jungle Rock by Hank Mazzell. Right. Which was a hit in 75 or something. Uh, it's an old rockabilly song. And I think someone's taken... The film of Pan's People Dancing to that and, and put, put it mine to, on it. It works, doesn't it? Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's when I had a little studio across the road. I loved the little basement underneath the community centre. And uh, I'd just go there and just flick a switch and everything would come on and I'd make music. It was a drum kit in the back. And is it you singing on that as well? Doing backing vocals. Right. Oh, no. Oh, it is me singing. He does backing vocals. He does backing. Yeah, yeah you're it is me singing. Do you enjoy singing? Uh, sometimes. Yeah. Not all the time. I haven't got a great voice. You see yourself more as a player than a singer then, do you? Yeah. Yeah, yeah a ranger. Um, what's the first song you and Morrissey co-write together? Jack the Ripper. And which album was that on? Was that Vox it was, or? It was a B-side of uh, certain people I know. Um, I'd given him songs, um, nothing that struck a, a chord with him. Did you have any input on the writing or arrangements on um, your arsenal? Or were you just a kind of player at that point? I was the band leader. Um, I played, the, me and Mick Ronson played recorders on it. Uh, trying to remember the session. So we were mainly live. How was that working with Mick Ronson as someone who'd grown up? It was, it was great. Loving was, glam. Yeah, he was a great man. Yeah? Yeah, he can't really say enough about him, really. He was, uh, it was, it was a joy to be around. It was just a... Uh, and I spent quite a lot of time in it because we started we started off recording at Utopia Studios around the back of Primrose Hill, and that was closing down, so it was a bit of a ghost studio. And then we went round to Mayfair in Primrose, round the corner, and then we went to the Wall Hall near Bristol, and then we went to Hook End and did all the mixing and finishing off there. So I spent quite a lot of time with him. We used to uh, get the uh, Sporting post in the morning and work out our bets, and we go into town and do little weird little Yankee bets. And it's good. It's good. <laughs> and the sound of that album is very uh, glam and rockabilly inspired, isn't it? Yeah. So it must have really it's uh, it's sat well with both your styles. Yeah, it was perfect. It was uh, even though I didn't have any songs on it, but that was my kind of arranging head, really. Yeah, and how we would play them. So like you're gonna need somebody on your side with the on 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 and the uh, those great um, chords strung strummed at the end. Yeah, good days. Because I was watching the documentary on Morrissey the other day, and a lot of people were saying he works in this really interesting way. That you'll say go to him with a template of a song, and it'll be like intro, verse, chorus, verse, bridge, and then he'll sort of not approach it in that way will he he'll go let's actually use the oh, yeah, the yeah. verses maybe the intro and oh, and then def- you sort definitely of there's no there's no rules what you thought was a chorus not just be an instrumental section <laughs> no, <laughs> not, nothing on it whatsoever or yeah. it might go yeah it yeah might get booted out what you thought was a, a great hook that you'd written might um, end up on a cutting room floor what is the first co-write did you ever see the promo of it no i'd oh. love to promo is fantastic So, I don't know if you're aware of the, the T-Rex covers. 
that look exactly like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. Moz. So, so it's very much in that. So that's like the T Rex. The T Rex yeah, colours yeah. are exactly the same with the picture of Bowling on. So that's the uh, certain people with Jack the Ripper on the other side. That's, that's very cool. But these are very hard to find now. He's always had great sleeves, hasn't he? Yeah. And what's that? Oh, that's an old ticket, is it? That's the first gig I ever did with Morrissey. So I don't know why they're in there. But they're in. I don't know. Memories, isn't it? Yeah, well, trying to, trying to uh, boost the memories. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> memory, memory full, I think. Mental clues. Um, what was the gig where the enemy went after him and started criticising him for r- wrapping the flag around him? Um, that happened at uh, Finsbury Park at the Madness shows. It was all around the same time, really, 91, 92. Because of that track as well. Because it's funny with with artists like that because they don't overtly, do you know what I mean? Say this is wrong. You know, if they, if, if you try and approach a subject like that in an intelligent way, you often get accused of, you know, sympathising with the thing that you're actually condemning. Well, I can't really talk from Morrissey. Yeah. Um, but uh, that song is a very sympathetic song, isn't it? Just observing basically the downfall of a young boy, and yeah. it's not going. Oh, let's celebrate this. We've lost our boy. Yeah. Do you think that's just journalists trying to gun for a scoop? Well, they a... seem to do it all the time. It's just relentless, really. Um, I'm quite fortunate it doesn't happen to me. Do you think that was part of him moving to LA then, was just I've had enough of the British media? I don't know. As I said, I can't really talk for him. Surefire way to escape, isn't it? And just not have to put up with that bullshit and just enjoy <laughs> <laughs> a lot quieter life. <laughs> I don't know. Um, let's talk about, Boz, if you don't mind, the Bowie tour. Oh, yeah. How was that for you, again, as a, a young glam child? I know you didn't do the, the complete tour, but well, the shows did, that you did do together. We did the four nights at Wembley, and the little bar there afterwards became my local for a week, which is quite weird. Um, I mean, I, I hate to be one to moan, but the first, the first show, I think, I believe that we had to use their lights, which were set for him and not for us. So they weren't on us. They were set at the wrong angles. Because you were obviously in front and of where no his band were going to play. When we were going on. And uh, so the first gig was, wasn't was very good, really. But it got better. On paper, that bill for me, and if it happened today, if he was obviously still around, would be perfection. But did the fans of those two camps gel and sort of, or was it a very much a case of Smiths fans in one corner and Morrissey fans, and then I don't, I don't know, I don't Bowie fans I in don't the other. Remember it being bad. I remember my mum going to it. Yeah, and my dad said, "Take a video camera and and uh, film some of it." And of course, you got stopped going in with a. <laughs> and I got because they would have been call. massive cameras in those times. Yeah, uh, boss, your mum's. A, you have to go and take a camera off of it <laughs> so they're not let, allowing her in with a video camera and then I remember someone going here are you Bozzy's mum <laughs> it's quite funny <laughs> there's no footage of her so she couldn't film anything how was David did you get many one on one moments with him nah, not really I no. spoke to him a few times he uh, came in the dressing room a couple of times who's been some of your other favourite people you've had the chance to sort of write and create with was Kirsty McCall a highlight for you oh yeah yeah, um, what a talent she was. We loved Kirsty. Um, we used to go down to her house a lot, in Mount Mount Park Road, in um, in Ely. She was always having parties, and there was always interesting people. Victor Spinetti, I spent some time with him once. It was quite just odd, bizarre, and um, the time that Lynn rubbed waspies on Lionel Bart's head. <laughs> He'd been upstairs, the kids were playing table tennis and the ball had gone somewhere and he got underneath and he banged his head. He came downstairs and Lynn was taller than Kirsty, so she could look in the cupboard. And he said, oh, banged my head, is there anything for a banged head? And Lynn went, oh, let's have a look. Um, oh, there's some wasp ease. And he said, well, that'll do. So Lynn applied wasp ease to Lionel Bart's head. Very odd, but, you know. And did it have any positive or I healing effect? I don't know. I just thought it was a 
It was a, a, a lovely, weird thing that would only happen at Kirsty's house. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So Kirsty, Kirsty was great. Um, Edwin Collins, who's moved up to Scotland. His studio used to be just down the road here. And I used to go down and, and watch him record. And I, I did some work there. I played on a track or two with him. And then I did a tour with him a few years back on keyboards and sax. Nice. That was a bit of a change of pace for you then, is it? Yes. Uh, enjoyable. It's such a... He had the two strokes in him, I say. And uh, if you ever think you're having a bad day, you know, um, he's quite inspirational, really, young Edwin. Haven't seen him for a while. Hopefully I'll see him soon. Adam, Adam's uh, Adam's great. As I say, I saw him at the Roundhouse. Very, very nice to see him back playing in front of a lot of people and uh, making music again. Yeah, he's... Uh, there was a, well, going through all this stuff. There was a couple of letters from him from a a few years ago, and there's a, as I say, he gave me that Day of the Dead thing. There yeah, yeah. I found, thought I might like it, and there's a massive Elvis poster. See where it says Ant, there's an Ant Adamant box set up there. Yep, above so that a massive Elvis poster. That's, I'm not, it, it's big, probably as big as that carpet. <laughs> from from you know from one of the films from the sixties. I saw it. Thought I might like it. I think it's oh. French. But no, I love him. He's he's a lovely boat. After um, Morrissey does move to the states, and I guess there's a quite a big intermission between um, the maladjusted album and you were the quarry. Is that when you start getting more into production? Because you've got a bit more time on your hands, or were you still touring during that time, even though records weren't being released? We did play quite a lot. Because um, he was without a record label, wasn't he, for quite a while as well. Yeah, it was about seven years between that and Quarry. But we still played. So touring was still a constant. Yeah, there's a there's there's been a couple of years where we've not played at all. Like whole years. Um but that's in the twenty eight years, so I mean to take some time off I think is a good thing. There's not many artists from his generation that have continued to be as prolific with releases and touring and to have really stayed true to who they are as an artist and to have the quality remain at an almost consistent level. Is there? Well, There's yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm surprised. Few and far between. I'm surprised I'm still having, managing to have hit records at, at my yeah, young yeah. age. You know? <laughs> and it's, 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 a, it's a great thing. And being on shows, obviously, like Jonathan Ross when Quarry was out and then Larry King and doing these cool television spots as well. Yeah, they keep coming. We just did James Corden over in... Uh, LA. The Late the, Late Show, is it called? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Did you ever do Top of the Pops back in the day? Yeah, I did. Yeah. T- twice with the Polecats, and then we did it with, with uh, Morrissey. They're, they're easy days. They're quite long, but they're not really that hard work. Is and, it a similar experience to shooting a music video? Um, no, because it's, it's a, a really short burst of th- three, four minutes, and the adrenaline goes through you, and you, and you settle in by the end of it, and then you're off, and yeah. it's done. It's and then you sort of like wanting more, really. But it's only four minutes. It's a one take deal, is it? Normally, yeah. yeah. We normally don't mess about. The, I think the last couple of TVs that we've done, in and out, just you know, no point in hanging about if you know what you're doing. Easy. What have been some of your favourite songs that you've written with Morrissey? If you had to pick a couple, it was an unreleased song called Kit that I really liked, but didn't get. To see the light of day. Um, Are there a lot of those? No, no, not really, no. Uh, a few, a few have come out. Uh, and I always like the the latest thing that we've been doing. I like Jackie. I like uh, uh, all the young people must fall in love. Um, I like the variety that they don't ever belong to one um, genre. Yeah, yeah, they can, absolutely. They can be folky or they can be really heavy and anything in between so um i don't really have favorites it tends to be the the things that we're doing most recently and moving ahead and moving on do you have any favorites from the live side that you particularly enjoy performing live um again that that changes and tends to be this the the newest songs that we're doing they might be old songs but if we haven't played them it's always exciting to put a new song in the set um, I'm trying to think of the most recent one. Uh, Break up the family. We hadn't played that for a long time. It's an old song, but it was new to, to 
to a lot of people in the audience. And when we did a song called Fantastic Bird that was unreleased from your Arsenal, but came out on a subsequent release. It was a, a whole, for us, it was a new song. I don't think I'd heard it for 30 years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good. From like a gearhead point of view, I don't play guitar, so, you know, I'm not going to be able to ask you any really technical expert questions but if you could share some of your favorite guitars and models that you use with anybody who's listening who might be particularly interested in that side of you because obviously you're known as a a guitar man well the the guitar the the electric guitar that i i believe has magic powers is the 63 telecaster that i play right and i don't know why but i've never found anything that sounds the same as it the first fender was a broadcast i think in 952 but they couldn't use broadcaster because someone was Gretsch were using it on a drum kit. So then it had no name, which is called a no caster. Then it became the telecaster. Uh, and 63 was the pre CBS years. For some reason, it's that particular guitar. I don't know what happened to it when it was made, but it's got a mojo. Uh, I love the, I have a Martin D45 acoustic that um, I don't use an awful lot, but it every now and again it gets used a lot and then it doesn't. And I think that's probably one of the greatest acoustic sounds. Although um, I have a Gibson SJ200 that I quite like. And that, I mean, there's an acoustic, there's a Gretsch Kingman over there, which is not really expensive, but it sounds quite nice. I use it here for working on tunes. And that is an acoustic, is it? Yeah. But it almost looks like it has an electric head. It has a, an old, like a Stratocaster headstock. And it depends on what songs we're playing. I change guitars on every number. Mm. Um, so they're in tune when they're given to me it's in tune so when I finish that song I take another guitar and that's in tune um, so there's probably th- three or four telecasters and then particular songs have particular guitars uh, for instance Istanbul is played on a, a Gretsch you need to get that. Yeah, it might be my electrician. It might be no a little bit early. <laughs> it's that. There you go. What is that? I don't know. <laughs> Something that my wife's ordered. <laughs> is it just one of those big pillows? Like a cushion? No, no. We're going to have this floor redone. Uh, it's never been right and uh, it's a little bit damp underneath so we're going to have the whole lot taken up and a new floor put in Very so nice. that's probably ceiling to go underneath the tiles there you go there we go have you always had the same guitar tech oh no no, no I've uh, they change about every three years right Munch was the first he was a he was a guitarist in um Temple Tudor, when they had two guitars. And uh, there's been a steady, as I say, probably about five or six. Gavin's my uh, current one. Uh, he's been with me for about three years. Lloyd was a, an old friend of mine from the 80s. We were in a band called the Blubbery Hellbellies. <laughs> and he moved great to the name. States and uh, he, he, he did my tech in for a while. There's been a few others in between. I guess pedals is another area that we should touch upon very quickly pedals. as well because I saw a tutorial uh, that you did for Boss on YouTube. That was very popular. I didn't think it was going to be that popular. Yeah, it had about 50,000 views. It's you going through the entire box and there's a hell of a lot of them. I'll, I'll, I'll do one of those and I thought I was just being friendly. I didn't think that anyone would be interested in it. Yeah, yeah. But um, there's not many in here because I've... So Boz is digging into... Oh, wow, there you go. That is a treasure chest of pedals, ladies and gents. Oh. <laughs> so these, these are mainly uh, things that I have that don't get out much, like the electro-harmonic baseballs, which is uh, an auto wah. There's an old dynamic filter, which is also a wah. There's an air synth that I used on the beginning of the Munich Air Disaster. 
Fender Phaser, which lights up blue. <laughs> My old SR16 drum machine, which I used in all my demos back in the day, including Jack the Ripper, that would have been on, done on that. Oh. And that uh, the Dan Armstrong pedals, the little ones, they plug into the guitar. Yeah. And they're a little strange. Because they plug into and the And it just sits on the body. And then you plug out of there. I remember these when I was a kid from the 70s. I started to collect them, but they're starting to go up in price. I've got a few. So yes, I like pedals, and um, I like Boss. They're um, very kind to me at the moment. Yeah, they hook you up. I, yeah, I went down and saw them um, last week. Yeah, just after we met, wasn't it? When you're talking about going down. That's right. Yeah, yeah. we went down and uh, I've uh, there's uh, an Echo called DM2, which is an old analog Echo, and I've just had one break on me. I use it on Jack the Ripper. So I've got a, I've got an alternative, st uh, one that we bought cheaper uh, in Ventura, but it's not the same. Yeah. So I've got an, a new one ordered. Isn't it funny how, because of the craftsmanship involved with things like this, that you just can't replace it for whatever reason, can you? Well, they're all different. Yeah. Um, and even some of the early um, pedals, there's a, a thing called a funk machine. And um, every single one is different. It's like that if you look at online, it all depends which one you get. A bit like Vox AC30s. Which one couldn't you live without if you could only have one pedal? Probably a compressor. Uh, a lot of people don't use them, but I use them a lot. Uh, jingle jangle, s string picking thing. Uh, I don't know when I started. Probably started with Morrissey using them. But a compressor, I have a compressor on all the time. And a, an acoustic simulator, which makes the sound of an acoustic, and that goes through all the time. So I'm always compressed, and I've always got an acoustic sound in the background. Because when we started recording, we I would do an acoustic or an electric rhythm, and then I did the same thing on an acoustic. So when we played live, I was thinking, well, it's not, not getting the whole sound. So that's when I started using the acoustic simulator. So when I'm playing a rhythm... It also sounds, so you get the acoustic sound as well. There you go. Tricks of the trade. Can we talk at all about the latest and up-and-coming record? Um, we did an album of covers, and I think it's coming out in May. Uh, and it's about American 60s songwriters. And the title is Common Knowledge. California Sun. Yeah. Spell S O N. That's, that's it, really. I mean, I, I love it, but you know, it, I think the track listing is common knowledge. Yeah, and, uh, yeah, yeah. It's well, J Joni Mitchell and the yeah. the likes, Carol King and yeah, Roy Orbison. A, I mean, it, it's quite quite incredible, really, because um, a lot of those songs were just done with an acoustic and someone singing, and to do them as a band. And to arrange them was a was a was a great thing. It's a, I think it's a stunning uh, album. And will that be toured, or is that as yet to be oh, determined? I don't know. Uh, I don't know at all. I don't know from one day to the other. <laughs> <laughs> and do you and Morrissey have a lot of shared common tastes in songwriters and in music? And do you have similar, you know, key touchstones in your? I don't Wall know. of inspiration. Morrissey always amazes me. But his knowledge is so vast that uh, he amazes me sometimes with things I've ne I don't know, I've never heard of. That I have to go and look up and play and listen to. Um, so he he's definitely um, guiding me in in uh, listening to a lot of music. So you've got this interview coming up in a moment where you've got to talk about ten albums you couldn't live without, or your ten all time top favourites. Yes. Give us a taste of what's in this list. I know it's not yet quite complete. It's, <laughs> <laughs> it's missing the final piece. Well, there'd be Electric Warrior by T-Rex, Ooh La La by The Faces, Sticky Fingers by The Rolling Stones, The Elvis Sun Sessions, Devon Wonder Bollocks by The Pistols, The Scream, Susie and the Banshees. Okay, yeah, right. Um, what is it about that? Just the landscapes of oh, music. I love Susan and... the Banshees. Um, before they signed a deal, I had all the the um, 
John Peel sessions that I would uh, have on a cassette player at school. I saw them in at the Roundhouse in 77 with the Buzzcocks. I saw them in 78. And their music was just a... It didn't have any rules. It sort of showed me that you could do what you wanted, really, and, and it could be jagged and it could whoop and it could have odd tribal drumming that didn't make any sense. It was... Uh, I, I loved the, that first Banshees album. It was The Scream, the first yeah. one. Yeah. Uh, Nicotine Stain is a song I like on that. That's good. Yeah, that was because I I knew most of the songs on it. There were a few... That was one of the new ones, and Suburban Relapse, Switch, and... Uh, I can't think now. Probably Pure, the, that first the instrumental. Jigsaw Feeling, is that a song Jigsaw on that album? that was a new one as well, yeah. Um, yeah, I love that record, and Steve Lillywhite produced it. And then an album by a band called Tupelo Chain Sex called What Is It, which is a mad jazz, rockabilly, punk, right. dub. All of it. <laughs> a mad mixture, which then showed me then more ways to go. That there were, definitely weren't any rules, and you could mix anything you wanted to mix together. That was a, a, an album that I know inside out. Um, probably the, the uh, one of the MCA Rare Rockabilly albums, which has got, Hank Garland playing guitar on most of it. Um, and that is the... How many is that? That's the nine, I think. Is that nine? I think we stopped counting at Susie, but I think you were at six on Susie. I've made a note. I've made notes. And we've got to get this last one decided now, Moth- Boz. Mothballs. Draft excluder. I never heard that. Great What's Princess. That? Elvis Sunshine. This is a scream. What is it? Never mind the bollocks. School's out. Alice School's Cooper. Out. Alice Cooper, yeah. <laughs> Love it. Um, Sticky Fingers. And I'll put the White Album, another album that I know inside. I learned all my acoustic guitar from uh, The Beatles Complete. So I started off with simple, something like Eleanor Rigby, and ended up with things like Sexy Sadie or the finger picking on Her Majesty. So I knew a lot of Beatles songs. And when I was a kid at school, I bought Beatles records off anyone that would sell me them at school. So they come in and I give them a pound and they give me please please me or Beatles for sale or with the Beatles. And Neil Spanbox sold me a mono copy of the White Album for 50p because it wasn't in very good condition. Well, who, who was your mate we were with the other day who said it was, well, that's the guy who works in your shop and he said it was all downhill after please please me or something. Andy after- Hackett. No, after the, after the, <laughs> the uh, Star Live at the Star Club. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it went downhill after Live at the Star Club, which I, I mentioned to him the other day when I saw him on Saturday. I thought it was funny. It was a good, it was a good comment. <laughs> How did the White Album do at the time of its release? Was it just too out there for a lot of people at that time? Because it was obviously so expansive, wasn't it? And you had almost like precursors to grunge and heavy metal and all I these. I don't know how it went down, but there's, I mean, it sold a lot in a lot of countries. I'm, I've got several copies of it from different places. Uh, so I didn't, yeah, so that's when I got that album. And I've, I like every track on it. Even the weird revolution number nine, they've all that number nine, number nine. Yeah. <laughs> um, I've just, and I, my brother had Let It Be, Abbey Road, Help, and Sergeant Pepper, which I used to steal and play. I've just got the box set of Let It Be up there. I saw that on my way in. Not that I was being nosy, but I did clock that. Look at that. Found in a shop. Now, was was that the last album they recorded, or was it the last album they released? It was the last album they released. Released. So released. Abbey Road was recorded after that, was it? Yes. The Spectre. I found this in a shop in Amersham last weekend, but it didn't have that, and it did. It's in have, pretty pretty decent condition. Well, it didn't it? have that tray, but there you can get one on uh, eBay. So I bought a replacement tray. I just saw the book behind the counter. I saw the, that bit of the book. Right, right. And I said, was there any pages missing from the book? He went, I've got the record in there somewhere. So the minute you open this up, it cracks and the pages fall out. But it seems to be complete. There you go. So I've put it together. So is your shop open every day of the week? No. No? No, not at all. 
Is it open, not, not reg- open. regular hours or as and when? So well, we can give th- the- Thursday to Sunday. Thursday to Sunday. And it's Parkway, right, in Camden? 88 basically. Parkway. Underneath Sands at Swing. You have to go to the back of the shop downstairs. Which is basically right next door to the Dublin Castle. Yep. So if people want to come by and pick up a record, that's the best times of the week. Is it Thursday, yep. Friday, Saturday? Yeah, I'm normally in on a on a Friday or, or Sunday. Uh, oh. Now careful now, Boz. I'll just wrecked it then. <laughs> But I thought I'd keep hold of that myself, really. So is what we have here your personal collection? <laughs> personal. <laughs> um, there's things I pulled out of the shop. There's some progressive things, some reissues on the top. There's some stuff I played on. There's some rare things there that, that don't belong in the shop, really. Is there any music you really don't like? Not really. There's good and bad in everything. The only genre that matters is quality, right? Yeah. Yeah, I like that. What's the rarest record you own? Um, it's in the safe. Is it really? Yeah. I'm going to go make you go. <laughs> I love that you have a safe for your records. There's a few in the safe. That's amazing. That is the sign of a true collector. This is uh, Midsummer Night Scene by John's Children. But it also comes with the original label copies. And that shows that the B-side was originally going to be Jagged Time Lapse. That's faded now. That's the original label copy. With the Napier Bell production taken off. Now, how often with a record like this would you actually get it out and play it? Um, I haven't played it for a while. I used to play it. And there's the adverts. So, I mean, it hasn't been played much. You can, you can see it's pretty good condition. I used to have two. That's old one. And then, yeah, that's the original that it was going to be. On the 19th of June. So how many of these are there in the world? Oh, um, I might have seen five. Five? One, two, wow, three. and the whole world? I think that's very rare and it's very collectible and it's very expensive. But I think that this, no, not that, ja- Japanese, Mark Bowden, Hippie Gumbo. So, I like Davy Bowie's first record. Oh, yeah, yeah. Nice Jane. Davy Jones and the King Bees. On uh, Vocalion. I like his mod stuff. I do. I'd forgotten I had that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's a Pink Floyd record in there. French Arnold Lane. Eagle Boy by the Lonesome Drifter. With the uh, fantastic Teardrop Valley on the other side. They made about 200, I think it's near mint. Great rockabilly record. This is South African Desdemona, the only copy I've, I've known of. Must have been a radio copy because it says Avoid on the on the label. Don't, don't play it. So that, I don't know, you know, I can't I've put a value on it really. But they're the, uh, they're, they're my... They're the ones that are deemed worthy of being kept in the safe. Yes, in the It makes them very safe. special. <laughs> yeah. I love it. Uh, well, Boz, thank you very much for your time. Thanks for having me over. Lovely. Should we go and get a little pint? After, oh, you know, you've got to do your interview first, haven't you? Well, what's the time there? One thirty. Well, I've got I've got half an hour. All right. Do you want to go and have a quick drink? Yeah, we could do one. All right. Nice one, mate. Put it there. Oh, yes. and uh, finally, polecat shows. Are there any in the diary that you could... Tell us about um, before I let you go. There's been a couple. There's uh, there might be one at the Blues Kitchen in Camden. We've done that quite a lot, and it's quite an easy gig, and it always sounds good, and it's free to get in. And there's, I'm not sure when that might be. And there's penciled in one for the Hundred Club at the end of the year, probably October, November. And there's that what that all day one you're doing as well in Birmingham, right? Yeah, but that's sold out. Oh, that's, that's gone. Yeah, that's that's uh, it's got every neo rockabilly band in the. <laughs> that ever was and uh 
and it 20, sold out in minutes. Twenty pound a ticket, right? At the uh, Irish Centre. Yeah, yeah, in uh, Digbeth, yeah, Digbeth, yeah. That um, that sold out straight away. Yeah, and it's, it's an amazing bill. When is that? I might try and sneak into that. I think it's June the seventh. June the seventh, right on. And the website, if people want to go and keep up to date. Um, Polcat's got a Facebook. Uh, the shop, uh, Vana Boutique's got a Facebook. And people can order from you online as well, can't they? If they can't make yeah. it into Canada. Yeah, there is a, there's a, it does say that it's not uh, secure, but because it goes through PayPal, it is secure with the payment. I can vouch for him, ladies and gents. He's a trustworthy man. And the Morrissey album, California Sun, out late this year, potential tour. All right. Thanks, Lovely. mate. Thanks Cheers. for coming on. Lovely. Thank you.